Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. As promised, I know so many of you have been waiting for the dolphin miracle and it's here, but there's so much more to this testimony today. This testimony is full of miracles and I love my guest I have today. Today, I have Carlos Vivas from Atlanta. He's originally from Venezuela, beautiful country of Venezuela. He has multiple miracles to share today. Jesus has always been a friend and always been a big part of Carlos's life. And he says as a child, he faced some bullying and Jesus was always his best friend through a lot of that. The first part of the miracles that we're going to share is a healing miracle. At age 14, he heard God's voice for the first time as he was facing a terminal diagnosis and the doctors told him and his mother that he only had three months to live. That is an amazing testimony piece right there. 2015 is the dolphin miracle story that we're going to share where he was almost drowned and a dolphin well, you'll hear the story. And this really changed his life. It was a pivotal moment for him where he completely surrendered his life to Jesus, had new priorities, a new heart for ministry and service. It's beautiful. And then the last part, which is my favorite part, is a vivid dream or an encounter with Jesus that Carlos had. And he thought at first it was just a dream, but then shortly after there are multiple confirmations of this experience that are going to touch you. And then we're going to wrap that up with a beautiful takeaway message. One of them is a message about forgiveness with three pieces to it that is going to bless you. And overall, I think this is going to fill you with hope today. And just a reminder that miracles are happening all around us. So Carlos, welcome. Hello, Julie. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me to your program. Very excited to be here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yes, yes. So can you start at around age 14 with what you faced at the doctor's office? Okay. I mean, look, when I was 14 years old, I just want to tell you a little bit this story. I started feeling bad going to school. I used to study in a Catholic school and they were very, very strict at school, you know? So you cannot like skip classes because you was sick. Like my mother was very strict too. And I was afraid to say that I, 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 I was feeling bad, you know, that was the eighties and I started feeling bad, bad, bad. And I said, maybe it's something that's going to pass on and I just going to hold it. I don't want to say anything to my mom because maybe she's going to think I don't want to go to school. I just going to let, I'm going to continue, you know, and the months started passing, passing, passing day through day. And I still feeling worse and worse and worse. And one day I go to a bus to stop waiting for the bus to go to school and I have a blackout. So as, as soon as I stand up, I say, I need to tell my mom something is going on tonight. So I get home that night when my mom uh, get from work and say, mom, we need to talk. There is something happening to me. And believe me, I want to go to, to, to school, but <laughs> we need to go to a doctor. Something is going on. I don't know what's happening. So she asked me, what happened? What, what's going on with you? I said, like, well, uh, I've been feeling really bad. I don't know what it is, but it's getting worse. So make the story short, we went to 10 doctors. Why we went to so many doctors? Because all these doctors, they didn't know what I had, or they didn't want to say anything to my parents, you know? But the last three doctors, they redirect us to a specialist, a blood specialist. It was an hematologist. So at the end, we finished at the, the office of these hematologists, and he come and take blood sample from my finger, from my arm, and then he go to the laboratory, come back and say, like, I don't like these results. We're going to do a last test. It's going to be a bone, bone marrow test in your back. They didn't say that to me. They didn't. They say it to my parents, right? So they, the doctor called me to his office and said, like, Carlos, I need you to go inside of the office. I'm going to do a final test. I said, okay. So I go to his office. He, he told me, like, take your chair off. I'm going to put some alcohol in your back. And... I get uh, on a little bed that he had there. So he put alcohol, two nurses came. He put five shots in my back. It was anesthesia. And he said, wait 15 minutes, I'll be back. 15 minutes later, he come back and I hear a drill. I was facing the wall. I said, don't move. Everything's going to be fine. This is going to be quick. Don't worry. Everything's fine. So he started drilling my back. I didn't feel anything because I have anesthesia in my back. I didn't know what was happening. He's like, shh, 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 Carlos, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. And then whoop, he grabbed the uh, the sample and then he put alcohol again. And he put a band-aid in my back. I said, okay, you're good to go. 
just go outside with your parents and wait for me there. Like 45 minutes later, he come back and he said, okay, um, I have news for you guys, for my mom, my dad, and me. I said, come back to the office. I need to give you the news there. So I'm standing in the back of the office. Then there are two seats. My mom, my dad, they're sitting in front of me. Then the desk, then the doctor. So the doctor gets inside of the office with a little glass with some chemical inside and like a red cotton. And he said, this is the biopsy of the bone marrow. And I have news for you guys. So he sat down and said, like, he looked at me and he said, Carlos, I'm sorry to say this, but you have three months. And I was, three months? What are you talking about? Three months for what? I said, you have three months to leave. I said, like, what? Me? Three months to leave? I said, like, no, 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 no. Why? I said, because you have a terminal disease. It's leukemia. You guys came too late. There is nothing else that we can do. So my mom started crying. My dad started crying. I feel horrible, like, Chuck in the background. And that's where I heard the voice of God for the first time. I heard, he don't have the last word I have. And I was like, what? Who said that? But I, I was scared. I didn't want to say anything to my mom because that was a very intense moment, you know? If I say something to her, I don't want her to slap me on my face because she thought I was making joke of this moment. So I said, I'm going to keep this to myself. I don't want to say anything. Anyways, the, my mom started crying. She started arguing with the doctor. You have to save my son. The doctor, no, ma'am, there is nothing we can do. And she's like, yes, you have sons and daughters. You, have, you, you know that you will go to the end of the world to save your sons and daughters. And your office is full of diplomas from all over the world because you know what you're doing. You need to save my son. At the end, the doctor said, okay, let's do something. I have two options. Number one, we can travel to Houston, Texas and do a bone marrow transplant. And my mom said, and that will cure him. So, well, in most of the cases, yes. How much is that going to cost? Well, the doctor said, maybe you're going to have to sell your house, your cars, and everything you have because it's a very expensive surgery. And my mom said, okay, if I sell everything, will you save my son's life? It's like, we don't know. It's like 50-50 chance. And my, my mom's like, eh, no. What is the second option? The second option is you guys travel to France, and I'm working with another doctor on a formula formula is called android and he's he's gonna take that formula it's like a kind of chemotherapy and uh, that will start hitting the bone marrow and maybe start working so my mom used to work at the air force so her boss going to france get the formula come back i start taking the pills the first month after taking the pills i have to be on a bed connected with an iv and drinking these pills i was watching all the <laughs> tv and after a month, the doctor called my mom and said, okay, come to my office. I need to see how Carlos is going. I was supposed to be at the hospital, but my parents didn't have insurance at the time. So the doctor said, it's okay. I'm going to send you everything that you're going to need to be at home with a nurse. Uh, thanks God, our neighbor next door was a nurse. So she took care of me during the whole treatment, you know. But after a month, we go back to the hospital. He took the exams and everything. And he said, it's not working, he said to my mom. So my mom crying, my dad crying, I feel super bad. And after that, that visit to the doctor, we go home. I feel terrible. Next day, they go to work. I'm by myself at home. And I said, you know what? I have an idea. I have an uncle. They have a lot of money. He's rich. And I'm just going to ask him if he can borrow the money to us, you know? And like, maybe we can get the money and go to Houston, Texas and have the bone marrow transplant. So I... Asked my mom, mom, I have an idea. Let's call my, my uncle. And my mom's like, Carlos, you don't know him. He, I don't want him to go through this, so please don't call him. I said, but mom, no, please listen to me. I said, okay. Then next day she go to work, and I'm thinking all day at home, like, wait a minute, I'm going to die. She's not going to die. I, it's my life, you know. I'm going to call my uncle. <laughs> I was a 14 years old, so, you know, kid. So I called my uncle. Hey, uncle, it's Carlos. Look, this is going on with me. I need a favor. Please, if you can borrow the money to me so we can, me and my mom and my dad, we can go to Houston, Texas and do a bone marrow transplant. And he said, Carlos, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. And he hung up the phone. At the moment that he hung up the phone, everything turned black to me by my whole life. I said, okay, well, I guess this means that I'm going to die, you know? But in that moment, like a hit started going all over my body. And a thought came to my mom. I said, wait a minute. I'm studying on a Catholic school where they said, if you pray to God 
for salvation, you pray to God for healing, you can be healed. Let me try that. So I start praying like, God, I look to the ceiling and say, like, God, like, please help me. And let's do a deal right here. If you save me from this cancer, I promise you, I'm going to tell everybody in the world that you saved me because there is a lot of people that don't believe in you, you know, and I'm going to be a living proof that I survived because you saved me, you know. Well, after this episode, every day I was praying, I was visualizing myself like I was coming perfectly, like three months later, walking and running and going to school normally, everything was fine. Plus praying, praying, praying. Three months passed and the doctor called my mom and said, okay, it's time to do the final exams to see how he goes. So they took me to the hospital, my mom, my dad, and they put me on the CT scan. It's a huge machine, like you get inside and they took all like x-rays of your body. And then when the results come back, everything was blank. The cancer disappeared. So my mom was super happy, like, oh my God, this is a miracle. Doctor, thank you so much. Oh my God, this is a miracle. But the doctor have a like a bulldog face. Like, so my mom said, like, what's going on? Where you're not happy. I mean, we're super happy. Look, you don't have cancer anymore, you know? And the doctor looked at my mom and said, I'm sorry, ma'am, but this is called remission. So my, my mom said, what do you mean with remission? I said, well, this is when the cancer disappeared because we, he was in this too, with too much many chemicals right now. And it looks like it disappeared, but then it come back worse. And in that moment, when he said that to my mom, I was behind my mom and I heard the voice of God inside of me. and said, like, this will never happen to you again. And I was like, what? Okay. And after that episode, it never happened again. I was completely cured. It never come back come to me again. So every time that I see somebody with cancer, I'm like, you need to trust God. Like the Bible said, if you have like a seed of like, yes, like faith, it will, will grow and you will be saved, you know? So that's what happened when I was 14. Yes. That is phenomenal. And I know, I think when you first started doing the the therapy that he put you on, you said you were not seeing the results, like mm-hmm. everything kind of turned around when you started mm-hmm. praying. Yes. Definitely. Um, so praise God for that. Praise God. That is a beautiful thing. And to hear God speak to you so clearly both times, and it has not come back. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So I know you kind of live in miracles. <laughs> We're going to fast forward to the next piece that I want you to share is 2015 when you were at Panama City Beach and yeah. you got into a near drowning situation. Okay. I'm going to the story. So this is how this happened to me. This story changed my life forever. Because remember, when I was 14 years old, I made this promise to God. I was a kid. I told him, I'm going to tell the world that you saved me because you took the cancer from me, but I was a kid. I never did anything, you know? And I grew up and I I didn't do anything, you know? In 2015, I guess God said, okay, it's the time for you to start promise what you told me, you know? And this is what happened. A friend invited me to Florida, Panama City Beach for Memorial Day in 2015. We go there. Uh, we go to several beaches and it, everything was packed. And I tell to my friends, like, look, everything is, is full. Let's go to an island called San Andrew State Park, an island called Shell Island. And you have to pay $20. I don't think nobody wants to pay $20 to go here. So, okay, let's go there. So we go there. We get into the park. It was a beautiful day, sunny, breezy, and everything. I mean, it was blue, blue sky, blue water. We get a, a bus from the parking lot. The bus take it to a marina. From the marina, we get a boat that take us to Chell Island. Chell Island is in the middle of the ocean, like 25, 30 minutes in the ocean. This island is like a circle, a huge circle. I don't know how many miles have, but it doesn't have any pounds on anything. So nothing to cover you. So we arrive to the island. And when we arrive, we go through the bay side of the island. And it was packed. So uh, I asked the driver, excuse me, sir, this is packed. Could you take us to the other side of the island? I said, no, because we're a national park and we take all the people that come here to the safest part. And this is the safest, the bay side. If you want to go to the other side, you're on your own. So you're going to have to walk by yourself. So, okay, cool. So we get out of the boat. I told my friend, like, let's go. Let's go to the other side. It's open oceans. People don't like to go there because it's a little bit more dangerous, but it's okay. We're not going into the water. We're going to enjoy the day here. 
Anyways, we start walking around the island. When we get to the other side of the island, there was nobody there. I have a big tent. I start opening the tent. The wind starts blowing really hard. Me and my friend were trying to put the tent down. The tent opened like a parachute. And for 45 minutes, we're fighting to put this down. What this means is was like a sign from God, like, don't stay here. Go back to the bayside. But we didn't listen, you know. And at the end, after 45 minutes, we find four rocks and put it in every corner. And we stay there from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We have an amazing day, have fun and everything. Around 4 p.m., my friend said, Carlos, we're going to walk around the island. Do you want to come with us? I said, like, no, 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 no. I'm going to stay here taking care of the stuff here. You guys can go. I've been coming to this island for over 10 years. So I know the whole island. So don't worry. What you have, guys need to know, like you need to go back here in the next 45 minutes to an hour because the last boat, it leaves at 5.30. So we need to pack all this and go back to the other side to go back to San Andreas State Park. Say, so, okay, yeah, we, we go fast. So they leave me alone. They 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 go on, going to around the island. And by myself, like I say, it's a sunny day. And then it started getting hot. And I said, it's getting too hot. I'm just going to swim a little bit. I'm not afraid to swim because when I was a child, I was on a swimming team. And I jump into the water, start swimming. And out of the sudden, something came under the water. I didn't know what it was. It was a riptide. I didn't know what a riptide was. So I started fighting with this current. So it was like a whirlpool under the water. And this thing throw me far, far away. If you guys ever see the movie Finding Nemo, you see a riptide called Australian Current. It's like a tube under the water that take you far, far away. I think I was in the same thing. So this thing drove me far, far away. So when I pulled my head out of the water, I was super far away from the island. I said, like, how in the world I'm here? I need to swim back to the island. So I said, okay, I'm not going to panic. I'm just going to swim. So I started swimming, swimming, swimming. But every time that I pulled my head out of the water, I was farther and farther and farther. I said, like, what's going on? I, oh, my God. Okay, let me swim again. So I was swimming harder and harder and harder. Get my head out of the water. Farther. It's like, how this is happening? What I didn't know, I was in the middle of this riptide. And the riptide was taking me to the ocean. After 15, 20 minutes, I get exhausted because I was fighting, fighting, fighting. I started getting cramps on my arms, on my legs. And I knew at that moment, this is it. I'm going to die right here. Nobody's going to listen to me. The time for the last boat of the island is about to come. My friends are on the other side of the island. Nobody's watching me. I'm far away. So this is it. So in that moment... I turn my eyes to heaven and I say, okay, God, I never in a million years thought that today is going to my it's going to be my last day. But before I go, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters. Thank you for my friend. Thank you for everybody that was in my life. And I'm sorry if I did something that you didn't like, you know. And in that moment, after I said this word behind me, I heard a voice that said, ask for help. It was a very sweet voice man but very very powerful but soft so i look back and i look everywhere and i just hear the water and just the wind i was like what was that and then i tried to swim again and then i heard the voice again ask for help and i was like are you kidding me are you here like where are you at i don't see you like please could you help me if you're here could you help me nothing it's like, maybe this is my imagination i continue swimming and then a the third time, I said, I told you to ask for help. And I was like, okay, okay, don't you see that I'm far away? There is no way I'm going to survive. It's okay, I'm going to ask for help. So I started waving my hands, help, help, help. At the end of the island, one of my friends, Enrique, one of my friends, he came out of the group because he felt something was wrong. And he ran to the tent. He didn't saw me there. He walked around the beach. He didn't saw me around. So he went to the top of a hill, some rocks. And he saw me from there. And then he started jumping. It's like, Carlos, Carlos, I'm going to call 911. Hold on, hold on. So he's jumping from the rocks. He's going back to the tent and he grabs some uh, tubings. He go back to the top and he dropped the tubings from the top. And the tubings was flying back to him because the wind was against him. I was like, oh my God, this is not working. This is not working. So he said, hold on, Carlos, hold on. So he ran back to the other side of the island and grabbed people that was boarding the boats going back to Panama City. A lot of people is running from the other side of the island, go back to the rock, to the top. Six guys jumped from the rocks. Everybody was coming my way. 
And after like 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes, I see everybody start turning around. It's like, well, where are they going? Like, where are you going? You're going to save me. Oh my God, please God. And then I heard a thunder. And when I look back, I see the sky is turning black. It's going really dark. And I see a lightning on the water and everything is turning like a thunderstorm behind me. I was like, oh my God, that's why they're turning back because the riptide was a thunderstorm. Nobody's going to save me here. And in that moment, I said, you know what, God, I don't want to fight anymore. If this is my time, this is my time. And in this moment, I always want to make a pause because what I did is something that I tell people to do if you are desperately like I was. So in that moment, you know, is surrender. How many times in your life you're going through divorce, you're going through cancer, you're going to fighting with your with your couple or your sons and your daughters at school, at work, and the only and you cannot fight with the problem. You you have done everything in your life, but nothing is going on. And the only thing that you have to do is surrender and let God to take over. And that's what I did in that moment. I surrendered and I said, God. I did everything on my own to get saved, but I cannot do anything. So whatever you want, just do it right now. And in that moment, a huge wave came and crushed me all the way under the water. So when I was under the water, I opened my eyes and under the water, I see this big black shadow that's coming my way. And I was like, oh my God, shark. So I covered my face, waiting for the bites. Like, no, 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 I'm going to get bite. And guess what? This thing come under me, grab me by my stomach and push me all the way up. So when I get out of the water, I couldn't believe what it was. It was a huge, great dolphin. So I grabbed the dolphin by the tail and I start crying because I couldn't believe that a dolphin saved my life. You know, I, I, I never heard that the dolphin saved people or anything. So I grabbed the dolphin by the tail and just crying like, oh, my God, how did you save me? How did you know I was drowning here? Like, oh, my God. The dolphin didn't move. He was just there, just looking at me, just floating with me. Ten minutes pass, a feature boat show up in front of me, and this guy started screaming at me, son, hold on, look, I'm going to save you, but I cannot get close to you because the wave from the thunderstorm, they are so big, I'm going to hit you with my boat. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw you a rope. So he threw me a rope. I go with the rope to the boat. The dolphin is still next to me. So when I get to the boat, I hold the rope, and I get air like, boom. so when I get air, the guy starts screaming up there. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I said, like, sir, I'm super tired. I'm exhausted. I've been here for a long time. I said, no, no, no. You need to get in now. You don't understand. I said, like, what happened, sir? I said, you don't understand. My boat is sinking. I said, your boat is sinking. What are you talking about? I said, like, yes, I have a pump and the pump is stopped. And now all the waves, they're getting inside of my boat and the whole boat is getting floated. So you need to hurry up, go to the back. There's some steps under the, um, the water. You can climb those steps and jump in. So I go to the back. I see the steps and I jump in. When I jump in, I see the water is like this. And I say, oh my God, sir, do you have the whole boat floated? Do you have any bucket to take the water out? I said, we don't have time for that. Yeah, come on, sit down next to me. We need to get out of here. So I sit down next to him. He put a towel over me. I was shaking. I was frozen. And then he said, okay, let me ask you a question. Are you okay? I said, yes, sir. I'm okay, I'm fine. I said, what happened? I said, well, I was swimming there and a riptide grabbed me and put me all the way here and I was fighting and all this. It's like, wow, okay, but you're fine. Now, let me ask you another question. Where are you from? I said, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. What about you, sir? I said, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia too. I said, what? What part of Atlanta? And I said, I'm from Duluth. And he said, I'm from North Cross. Duluth and North Cross is next to each other. So we were neighbors. I was like, what? We're neighbors too? And in that moment, he grabbed his phone. like, oh my God, look behind you, look behind you. I was like, what are you talking about? Look. So when I looked behind me, he grabbed his phone and he started recording. Guess what? Behind us, the dolphin started jumping and following the boat all around the island. So when we get to the bay side, the guy said, look, son, every Memorial Day, I'm going to come to this island. But right now I need to go back to to the national park because I need to fix my boat. I'm gonna leave you here on the bay side so you can walk from here. But if you wanna see me again, every Memorial Day, I'm gonna be here with my family so we can see us again. Just to let you know, I've been going since 2016. I've every year I go and I never saw this guy again. I hope he can watch this video and show up, you know? <laughs> so anyways, I say thank you, God bless you. 
I jump off the boat. I start walking to the island. There was nobody on that side of the island because everybody ran to the other side. And when I was walking, something hit my leg. And when I look back, guess what? The dolphin was behind me. And I see the dolphin and he was like a dog next to me, just following me. So I would start crying like, what is, like, what was going on? Like, what is this dolphin following me? Like, I feel too much gratitude for God because he sent me with this dolphin. So I'm just crying. It's very overwhelming. I walk to the shore. And when I get to the shore, I go on my knees on the sand. And I make a promise there. I said, you know what, God? If you send me with this dolphin right here, it's because you have a purpose for my life. I don't know what you want from me, but I'm going to tell you something. From today, Carlos died in the ocean. The person who's coming out of the water is not Carlos anymore. It's going to be you. From today, I give you my life. I give you my soul. And I give you everything I have. So I'm going to be a vessel for you. Whatever you want to do, do it through me. But it's not my life anymore. I'm tired. This is you, okay? And in that moment, it started thundering, lightning, and raining. So I took that as a yes. After this happened, the dolphin leave. The police arrive. Everybody come from the other side of the island. Everybody start hugging me. Everybody crying. My friends telling me, like, what are we going to tell to your family? You know, like, you die in our hands. You were with us. Oh, my God, Carlos. So we cried there. They took me back to the uh, to San Andreas State Park, the National Park. They take me to management. I explain what happened. And after that, my friends asked me, what do you want to do? I said, like, I just want to go to a church. I just want to pray to God because this was a miracle, you know. And I have this grateful in my heart. I, I need to say something. So we get out of the San Andreas State Park. And the first church that we found was a Catholic church. We tried, we parked the car, we walked to the door. But when we tried to open the door to the main church, it was closed. So I said, it's okay, we... There was a chapel outside in a garden. So we did a circle, everybody that came from the beach and my friends, and everybody hugged each other, and we prayed for like 20 minutes. After we prayed, my friends asked me, Carlos, what do you want to do now? So like, I just take me back to the hotel. I just need to get something to eat and go to sleep. I take a shower and go to sleep. So okay. So I went back to the hotel, took a shower, get something to eat, and I went to sleep. As soon as I put my head on the pillow, I have an epiphany or a vision. I don't know. It never happened to me in my life. So this is the first time. So I open my eyes. I'm on the third floor of a cruise in the Caribbean. So it's a blue sky, blue ocean. It's a sunny day. The breeze of the ocean is touching my face. It smells like delicious. And then I open my eyes. And at the end of the ocean, I see a big, big wave racing coming my way. I was like, oh my God, tsunami. So I covered my face and was like, oh my God, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. Well, 10, 15 minutes passed and I still like, what's going on? What the, the, the wave didn't hit the, the boat, you know? And guess what? Somebody come behind me and touched my back and said, Carlos, open your eyes and look at me. I said, like, no, look, we're about to die. He said, you're never going to die with me. I said, like, who are you? He said, like, take your hands out of your face and look at me. I said, like, no, I'm afraid. Come on, look at me. And I take my hands off my face and I look back. And when I look back, I couldn't see his face, but he was a guy bigger than me. He had a white robe. And in that moment, I feel the presence of Jesus. From his face, it was just light coming out. And he said, close your eyes, please. So I closed my eyes. He helped me from behind. In that moment, I feel secure. I feel love, you know. So when he hugged me, 10 seconds passed and he said, open your eyes, please. I open my eyes. And when I look in front of me, I, I'm in heaven. And I was like, what? So he opened his arm and said, I look in front of you. Welcome. Welcome to heaven. And what I saw in heaven was like green grass, really green. It smelled like fresh cut grass. Clouds everywhere. It was beautiful. So he said, welcome to heaven. From today, you're part of me and part of all of them. And when he said all of them, millions of people show up in, in everywhere. And I see all these people dressing white robes and they were glowing. I was like, oh my God, God, like Jesus, please. Like this means that I'm dead. Like, no, no, no. You need to take me back. I need to do a lot of stuff. I cannot die right now. Okay. I said like, Carlos, you didn't die. But you make a promise to me. You need to fulfill your promise. Like I said before, welcome to heaven from today. You're part of me and part of them. You start walking with me and walking with them. Do you have any questions? I said, like, yeah, I have a question. I said, what is your question? I said, where all these millions of people came from? 
So they're coming from all over the world. You have another question? I say, yes. I always been asking me, there are like 50,000 religions in the world. What is the true religion? Some people say, my religion is better, my religion is better. I don't understand, like, what is the true religion? So like, Carlos, what I can tell you is when you come to heaven, in heaven, there is no religion. What you're going to find in heaven is the love of God. The love of God is going to unite whole humanity in one. And the most powerful force in the universe is the love of God. And in that moment, he puts his arm over me and says, okay, let's walk and let me give you a life review. A life review that he gave me. He passed my whole life in front of me like a Mac computer. So it was videos of all my life since I was a child, since I was born until my age. Showing me everything that I did for people, the good things, the bad things, and how people fell. So it was like I was judging myself for what I did. He wasn't judging me. It was me. I feel bad and good for things that I did. You know? And after that end, he said, okay, Carlos, now it's time for you to go back and tell people what happened here. So, okay, Jesus. So he pushed me down. Next morning, I wake up. I was like, what was that? So I told my friends and everybody that came with me the story. And that happened on Sunday. Monday, I go back to work. I've been working for 20 years for a service company as a quality assurance manager. So I get into my office. There are other three managers there. I say, guys, guess what happened this weekend? I went to Florida and I was drowning and a dolphin saved me. And everybody looked at me like, you're right. A dolphin saved me, Carlos. Come on. And then somebody behind me said, like, I believe you. And I look back. It was my boss. And it's like, why you believe me and they don't believe me? It's like, because I'm a Christian. They're atheists. Number two, I want you to go on your computer, in your desk, and Google how many people die in the United States every year by riptide currents. So I Google it, more than 100 people die every year in the United States because it's a silent killer. Then he said, now Google how many dolphins get killed all over the world and they're still saving people. So I Google that and 100 dolphins get killed every year. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Then he said, now Google, how many people have been saved by dolphins all over the world in history? So I Googled that. A lot of people through history have been saved by dolphins. I didn't know that either. And the last one, he said, now Google, what is the meaning of the dolphins for Christians? And when I Googled that, I was shocked. I was like, what? The dolphin represents Jesus. And I was like, wow, like, who would have thought that, you know? And I was like, this is amazing, you know? So it was a connection between what happened in my vision and the dolphin and my accident and all this, right? That happened on Monday. On Wednesday, my boss sent me to a customer because I do quality assurance. And one of my employees broke a lamp in a basement. So when I go to this customer, because I'm like, come on, Carlos, nice to meet you. I'm busy right now. I'm in the kitchen making some food, but you can go to the basement, go to the last room, turn the light, and you will see a gold lamp in the corner that is broke. You can fix it or replace it, whatever you feel good, you know? So I go down the stairs, I turn the lights, I get to the last room, and when I turn the light to see this lamp, I see the lamp, but next to the lamp was a huge painting on the wall. Guess what the painting was? It was all this scene in heaven with, Everything that I saw on my vision was there. It was hundreds and millions of people dressing white robes, Jesus in the middle, and at the bottom it was the ocean and dolphins. So this was very overwhelming for me. So I started crying. It's like, what is this? Like, oh my God, God, this is too much. Please stop. Like, what? So the customer comes, Carlos, are you okay? What's going on? I said, like, ma'am, I'm fine. Like, come on. So she come downstairs and what happens? Like, how in the world you have this painting right here? I was like three days there. So like, what do you mean? So, okay, let me tell you a story. So I told the story, you understood. I said, let me turn the light so you can appreciate the painting more. But I just want to let you know, this painting was one of my best friends of my family came three years ago with a big canvas. And I started doing this painting. And when he finished, he hanging up right here. And it's been here now since. So now you can enjoy the painting. So that happened on Wednesday. On Thursday, I called my best friend, Alex, and I told his story. He lived an hour away from my house. And when I told his story, he's like, Carlos, this is a testimony. You need to go to church. You need to tell people what's going on. I was like, brother, are you kidding me? I will never say that story. Who's going to believe me that a dolphin sent me? You know, like people is going to laugh at me. 
And you know how many haters are out there? No. So he's like, come on, Carlos, people need to know. Please, please, please. After an hour, I say, okay, I go to church on Sunday and I let them know people and you will see. Anyways, Sunday arrive. I travel one hour to my friend in Worcester. When I get there, his wife makes some breakfast. We get breakfast. And then he asked me, okay, what church do you want to go? It's like, it doesn't matter. Because Jesus told me that it's not about religion. It's about love, you know? I said, okay, just whatever. First church that I count. So he Googled the first church next to his house. And it was a Catholic church called St. Michael the Archangel. So, okay, let's go there. He never been there. I never been there. So when we arrived to this church, the parking lot was full. There was hundreds of cars there. People were celebrating. It was music. And I was like, what's going on here? So I asked a lady next to me, excuse me, ma'am, what's going on here today? And she said, like, well, this used to be a little church, but today we're inaugurating a huge church, like a cathedral. So you guys came in the moment of the inauguration. So enjoy it. So, yeah, we walked to the door and we saw the whole inauguration. By the end of the inauguration, I spoke with the priest and said, excuse me, is there any way that I can tell I have a testimony and I would love to tell this to people so people can have some sure when everything ends, you can go to the stage and tell this testimony. So sure. So at the end of the, the service, I go to the stage, grab the microphone, I start telling my testimony. And when I was in the middle of the testimony, a 17 years old girl, skinny girl, white girl with a black long hair, she raised her hands, excuse me, sir, excuse me. I said, yes, I want to ask you a question. I said, yes. I just want to ask you how Jesus was with you. I'd say, Jesus was behind me. What are you wearing in front of Jesus? What Jesus was doing? He was carrying me from behind. Why? I just said, you have to see this. I said, what are you talking about? So she grabbed the hair. She put the hair in front of her. She turned around. And in the back of the teacher, she have a print on her shirt in the back. And it was this image that I'm going to show you right here. It's called yeah, this one right here. It's a painting by Thomas Blackshear. It's called Forgiven. And then she asked me, it was like that? I said, yep, it was like that. So everybody in church is like, oh, my God, you guys planned this. It's like, number one, I never been in this church. Number two, I don't know this girl. So no, we didn't plan this. Anyways, the service ends. I finished my story, and I go back home. When I go home, I go to Google, and I Google this image, Jesus hugging a guy. And the image came with the story, a real story. In the year 1992, an American painter called Thomas Blacher, he started doing this painting. But before he started doing this painting, he started doing fasting, not eating and praying, drinking water, asking God to give him the image of Jesus so he can start doing this painting. So after two weeks, he started doing the painting. When he was drowning the painting, he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit said, Thomas, it's a beautiful painting, but you need to explain to people what is the meaning of the painting. What is the meaning of, you see the darkness that we all have, the illumination that we all have, the love of Christ with us. Everything that is in this painting, you have to describe from that book. So he wrote a book. What is the name of the book? Forgiven. And he wrote a book, and in every page of the book, he is playing part by part everything about this painting. And this is how my story ends. When I was in heaven, Jesus pulled me down to earth. Before that, he said, Carlos, before you go, I need you to tell people that they need to forgive. More than 98% of people around the world have childhood trauma. And they need to forgive three people. They need to forgive, number one, their parents. Why their parents? Because they didn't have a manual to raise you. If they didn't like you, if they hit you, if they abuse you, like I said, they didn't have a manual. They did everything they could to give you everything you have. Number two, you need to forgive your inner child because whatever happened in your childhood is not your fault. It's not the fault of that little kid that lives inside of you. He was afraid. Nobody could hear him. And, you know, everything that happened between one year old and seven years old is going to mark your whole life. So you need to forgive that little kid. And number three, you need to forgive every person that came to your life to harm you. Why? When you forgive your parents, your inner child, and the people that came to your life to harm you, you are not forgiven then. You're forgiving yourself. In that moment, you open your heart and you throw away all the hate, all the resentment, and all the poison that be eating you inside of you. 
that later becomes cancer and another illnesses, you know? And from that moment, you open your heart and it's like you have a balloon with a stream and you cut the stream and you let the balloon go and you're free. You're free from all this that's been killing you for years. And from that moment is when Jesus told me, you start living your purpose in life. Because Jesus told me everybody came to earth with a purpose. And what is your purpose? We all have gifts that God give us. In our heart, we have a treasure chest. So when we open that treasure chest, some people sing amazing. They're opera singers or they're really good singers. Another, they're good, amazing. Another, they're good builders. I mean, everybody has a specialty inside of their heart and they know what they're good for, you know? The only thing they need to open the treasure box and do it. And number two, he said, if they don't find that, the biggest, the biggest thing that humans can do to humanity is called service. That's the biggest purpose for humanity, service. And so like, why service? Very simple, because when you die, you don't want to take your cars, your house, your Bitcoin, your titles, anything. The only thing, the only thing that you're going to take when you die it's going to be how many people you help, how many people you give shelter, how many people you give food, how many people you give advice, how many lives you change on earth. What was your blueprint that you left on this earth for others to follow? Look, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Princess Diana, Martha Luther King, what they did was service, and their service continued until today. So now my final question for you is, what are you doing today? After you listen to my story, what are you doing today to leave a blueprint on this world before you leave? What is your message? And what are you doing to leave a legacy of love in your family, in your friend circles, you at work? Everybody that I know you, what are you going to leave that's going to transcend your life? So one day when you go to heaven, and you see Jesus and you speak with God, they're going to ask you, was worth it to be on earth? I said, yes, it was worth it. I did all this and I helped all these people. I didn't spend all my life on myself. I did good to others and I gave love to others. And that's my final message. Just give love and do the best you can in this life, helping others, because that's the only thing that we're going to take when we get out of this world. And that's my story. That is beautiful. That's beautiful. I think you did a perfect job ex- sharing your experience. And I, I think it's it's inspiring how you've had this ongoing relationship with Jesus mm-hmm. and the way he's worked in your life. And, you know, I, I've actually had people reach out to me and ask me with these experiences, which church did he say to go to? So see, I think it's really neat that he answered that question for you. And, you know, I know both of us believe, you know, there's only one way to heaven and that, that is through Jesus. Yes. And the Bible tells us he does look at the heart yes. and uh, the way that you surrendered and you did it genuinely mm-hmm. and you gave him your heart, you opened yourself up and you had faith in it. He is calling you to do these amazing things. And there's, there's so much more we can share. I know you obviously have your book help from heaven. I just want to show yeah. that one more time. And there's more miracles in here. <laughs> I really enjoyed talking to Carlos. We've talked a long time and I enjoy, I want to talk more. And then he's got more books that he's actually writing. There's another experience that he had with Jesus a message in Las Vegas. That's really interesting that yeah. I thought was right on point. So I look forward to what God is going to continue to do through you, Carlos. And I thank you for for this you. time today. Do you have a website yet or an, a contact? Yeah, yeah, I have a www.helpfromheaven.org. Okay. Or you can go, I have a, a page, it's called Help From Heaven on um, Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called Miracles Happen When You Believe is my Facebook group. And you can go there and you can, you can find me there. Yeah. Well, but I'm... in www.helpfromheaven.org is where everything is about me there. Okay. Excellent. And there's also a beautiful uh, documentary that was just done. I'll post that in the links as well. I'll post all these things in the links for people, but this has been amazing. It's just been amazing. So thank thank you you. so much. And uh, I just want to say a quick prayer over those listening right now on our way out. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We praise you for this miracle, the many miracles you have done. We praise you for what you did with Carlos when he was sick with leukemia and he was told he would not survive and then told he would, it would come back and you told him he it didn't. And we praise you for that healing. I praise you for whoever is praying for Carlos. I just think that's, I know she's out there. <laughs> she or he is out there. And I think that's part of what we're seeing now. I just love all the things that have been prayed over him and, and how you're continuing to move through Carlos and the love that he has for you and the the, the service he's, he's doing in people's lives is really beautiful. And it's just very inspiring. So Lord, we, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you that you're available to all of us, Lord, and that even just a mustard seed of faith can open the door to a relationship with you today, Lord. So I pray for that person listening right now that may not even know how to pray, that all you have to do is surrender and talk to him just like you would anybody else and say, Lord, I want to know you. I ask you to come into my heart. And if you proclaim that with just a pure heart, that he will come into your life. And I thank you for your word that that has all these promises in it that we that we can know you better, Lord. And I just pray that you would fill those people with a spirit of hope and joy and peace today, Lord, and whatever they're facing. And we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for listening today. I have missed this. <laughs> it's great to be back. So thank you, Carlos. And uh, thank you, Julie. You a, I appreciate it. Yeah. And if you have a miracle that you want to share with me, just reach out to me at everyday miracles podcast at gmail.com. And it might take some time, but I will get back to you. Thank you so much. And God thank bless you everybody. And God bless you too. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.